Hi, welcome back to My Smart Learning. This is a lesson for Year 12s. Uh, it's your A-level biology lesson, continuing from last week where we looked at genetic diversity. Uh, we moved on to biodiversity uh, on Chapter 10. So it's A-level biology. It's useful for Year 11s, thinking about going into doing um, A-level biology. But a lot of this also comes up in your GCSE biology too. So uh, what we're looking at today is the biodiversity Chapter 10. And remember, I did uh, lesson 10.1 in your Caboodle textbook. This is the second half of 10.1 because we looked at species last time. So we're looking at classification today. How are living things classified and why are they classified? And as usual, we start off with our recall quiz, high five. You get all five questions right, you get a virtual high five from me and you can't buy those in the shop. So you really want one of those. So. <laughs> Right, question one, write these down, question one to five, um, quick quiz, pause the video after I've done the five questions, and then afterwards I'll go, th I'll go through the answers so you can check. So number one, what is the definition of species? Number two, uh, what system do we use to name organisms? So what is the name of that system that we use to name uh, our different species, our different organisms? Number three, what are the two parts of this naming system? So that's what's it called. What is the two parts of this naming system? Number four, what is the purpose of courtship behaviours? So there's a few parts to that answer there. And question five, are horses and donkeys the same species and why? So have I got those? Pause the video and we'll come back to the answers after you've unpaused it. So, if you've done those, you quickly got a starter activity. The definition of a species is a group of organisms with similar features who reproduce, who can breed to produce living, fertile offspring. So, organisms that can breed to produce living, fertile offspring. That is the definition of a species. What system do we use to name these organisms? And we call it the binomial system, binomial system, binomial system. What is the two parts of the binomial system? Well, you name it with the two names. You have the genus name or the generic name, we call it. The genus or generic name is the first name. And then the second part to it is the species name. Now, if you recall from our last video, what you should have is the, the you write the binomial name in italics. So it should be slanted. The first name starts with a capital and the second name starts all, it's all in lowercase. Now, how is that system done? I, I forgot to mention it last time. Um, it's done sort of back to front. So for instance, if your name is, I don't know, let's think of a name off the top of my head, Bobby Singh, if, if that's your name, all right, you have your first name and your last name, so Bobby Singh, but if it was using your binomial system, it'd actually be named the other way around. So Bobby Singh's name would be Singh Bobby, okay? Because it goes surname, first name. It's a little bit like in the 1950s or 1940s when you used to go to school, instead of me calling out your name, so for instance, um, if I was calling someone's name at a lesson, I don't know, I'd say uh, Amar, uh, so that would be the, the name I'll be calling out, so oh, Aman, what's the answer to this question? In uh, 1940s, they'd call you by your surname. So they'll say Hussein, Mr. Hussein, or something like that. So they'll say Hussein. So they'll call you by your, your surname. And it's like a hierarchical system. So the binomial system is done back to front. So the name Amar Hussein would be Hussein Amar. The name Bobby Singh would be Singh Bobby. That's the binomial system. It's a two-part naming system. Number four, the purpose of the courtship behaviours, well, is to form a pair bond and it's so that you can recognize that organism that other the mate is of the same species so if you're of the same species they can reproduce to produce fertile offspring because if they're not the same species it'll be pointless having offspring that are not fertile so they can't pass on the gene, genes from one generation to the next generation uh, i'll come back to that on the next slide because i wanted to go into a bit more detail about that because i didn't do it last time um, are horses and donkeys the same species the answer to that is no, they're not. So why? Well, remember the horse had 64 chromosomes, the donkey had 62 chromosomes. That's their diploid number. If you get the haploid number in the gametes, so the sperm and the eggs, the horse would have 
Well, half of 64 is 32. So they'll have 32 chromosomes in this gamete. The donkey, starting off 62 with a 31 chromosomes in the gametes. If you've got a 32 and a 31, they can't fuse. Well, if they do fuse, they can't produce a diploid number. You'll end up with 63. Now, 63 can't be halved to make a haploid number again. So hence why, remember if you get a horse and a donkey, you get a mule, or what we said as an ass, and an ass can't produce, uh, it can't reproduce, basically. It's infertile. So going back into detail about the courtship behaviors, from a biologic, biological point of view, the whole point of life is for the species to survive over time, and that means it needs to keep reproducing and passing on its genes to the next generation and for so on and so on. I talked about legacy last time, so talking about um, all living things. The only thing they can pass on, obviously you can pass on your wealth and your buildings and what have you, but ultimately everything disappears over time. The only thing that's left on earth is your genes or half of your genes because sexual reproduction only passes on half of your genetic information. You're not a clone of your parent. It's not asexual reproduction. So we said the four parts of this then. One is to recognise that it is members of your own species. That's why some animals go around sniffing other animals to see, smell the pheromones, are they compatible? Identify if a mate is capable of breeding. So both partners must be sexually mature, fertile and receptive to mating. Uh, form a pair bond or a bond pair. So they allow mating and the raising of the offspring. Okay, usually the, the pair stay together. Like in humans, they, they tend to stay for life unless they get divorced or something. Um, but other animals, uh, the, the male will mate and then bugger off, he'll disappear. And then it will be just the female that raises the young. But it might be for a few months, it might be a few years. In humans, which are odd creatures, they have their children around with them uh, up to about 18 years. You might say fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. But, um, you know, 16, 18, 18 years and then the birds tend to fly the nest. 18 years. Wow, that's a long time, almost two decades. However, if it was other animals, they literally, by the time they're walking, parents will say bye-bye and they're off to fend for themselves. Um, now, if you imagine you had children in Hansworth and you left them out on the streets to fend for themselves after they just stopped walking, they wouldn't last very long, especially walking down our road. Anyway, um, and then synchronizing mating. So it takes place when there is a maximum probability of the sperm and egg meeting. So there are the four things uh, for courtship behaviours, why it's necessary. I sort of skirted over it the last time, there's a little bit more detail. Your 12s, I've posted the PowerPoint on Show My Homework. I know Sophie's emailed me on the, or sent me a message on Show My Homework. I am, every time I do these PowerPoints, I keep adding on extra stuff to them. Um, this one on chapter 9 and 10 are sort of all stuck together. It's a working document, I keep adding on extra slides to it. Um, but I'm going to keep sending you the same slideshow. Um, but you'll have extra bits attached to it as you, as you go along. We'll probably be done maybe sometime next week with it. So it'll be a quite a big PowerPoint. And then after that, we're coming close towards half term. Um, we'll probably be starting the year 13 chapters, looking at sort of uh, respiration and photosynthesis. So I'll be, I'll be starting that as well. Anyhow, so what do I need to know from today? We're looking at classification. So what is classification and what's its purpose? And how is classification related to evolution? So they're the learning objectives as such from your Caboodle textbook. So classification, if I go on to this taxa idea, classification, what is it and what's its purpose? Well, it's, it's literally a way of organizing all of the different species that are on the planet into categories. That's literally what it is. So if you can recall, how many species are there? So last time we talked about it in our starter, there's about 1.8 million species that we actually, scientists know about, or should we know about, that's a record of it. But scientists, you know, there's some becoming extinct all the time and, and there's loads and loads and loads that we've never discovered already. And scientists got an estimate, so a massive range of estimates, so anything between 5 million to maybe 100 million species on Earth. So, you know, there might be 99, of million that we don't even know about, 98 million that we don't even possibly know about that are out there. And I said, if you discover them, you could potentially name it after yourselves to, to a degree because we use the binomial system to name them. But why do we need to categorize it? Is it because this classification system is for the animals or is it for us? Well, actually it's for us, it's a man-made thing. So it doesn't always fit. Now, I'll give you an example for that. 
if you imagine, why do we have this categorization system? It's, it works in the hierarchical system, sort of like a, a list system. One is a bit more important than the other. And I sort of talked about the binomial system name, that your surname comes before your first name. So like Singh, Bobby. So it's like going back into your ancestry and going back and back and back. So you are important, obviously, but then your parents are more important than you. But then your grandparents are more important than your parents. And then your great grandparents are more important than your grandparents. And it's like a hierarchical system. And it, the naming system works in that kind of that kind of fashion. And the purpose of it is to categorize organisms, because if you come across something that you've never seen before for the first time, and you see a picture of it. Now, nowadays, obviously, we've got Google and we've got a camera that can sort of take a picture of something. There are plants out there that you could literally, with your, there's apps out there where you can just take a photo of the plant or with the leaf or the flowers, and it will scan the entire internet for you, and it will, it will identify that plant that you've never seen before there. And obviously, if you can't, and it's never been categorized before, you've discovered something new. So animals are the same. All the different organisms out there, you may never have come across this animal before, so what you do is you go through a classification key. So if you ask things like, does it have a backbone? Yes, no. Does it have wings? Yes, no, and so on and so on. And you can work out, does it have feathers and so on and so on until you get to a particular point, but you can't break it down any further. And then that is your organism. And we've got 1.8 million different species out there. So obviously you can't just have all this information in one place. You, you need, if you find something, you don't know what it is, you can't go through a list of 1.8 million things. It's a way of categorizing things into a certain box. Why? It's all about speed. Now, let me give you an analogy or some kind of uh, anecdote. I went to the supermarket the other day. It was almost a week ago. My food's nearly running out in the fridge now. So I went last Friday and uh, nowadays you have to queue. You know how long they took me to queue at Tesco the other day? An hour and a half. I had to wait outside Tesco Spring Hill round the block because we have to socially distance obviously you have to be two meters in front of us and two meters behind you and so on and people with their masks and what have you and they're letting you in one by one but as you go in now what you have to do tesco is you have to follow those arrows you have to go around those a bit like ikea you have to follow those arrows and you have to go around and you, there's a one-way system in, in the supermarket so you need to go through nearly every aisle well that's how ikea make you do it so you end up buying more stuff anyway i'm not going to be taking the make of ikea they might try to sue me because i don't like that shop anyway um, the, the purpose of the supermarket, why am I saying this? So if you imagine your supermarket, you go into, you know, there are, I obviously mentioned Tesco, there are other supermarkets available. If you go into your local supermarket and you're looking for, let's say, your weekly shop of 10 things, uh, let's just make these up, bread, milk, eggs, cheese, um, meat, fish, um, juice, uh, Pasta, rice, and onions, right? So, get your 10 things, right? Now imagine you go into your supermarket and uh, there's no signs, it's all like a jumble sale in there. There's no signs, there's no shelves, everything, you just go in and say, right, it's a free for all, everything's all scattered everywhere. And you go in there, well, how long is it gonna take you to go and find your 10 pieces of items, your 10 items for your shopping, go through your self-checkout or your normal checkout and then come out? Well, obviously it's taking ages, because you're gonna, what, it took me an hour and a half waiting outside. It probably took me three hours going around the shop looking for the stuff, right? Exactly. Now, if you imagine you go to the supermarket now, but now it's organized in shelves and the shelves, you know, your cheeses are in a certain section, your milk is in a certain section and so on and so on, like a normal supermarket, but there's no signs. If you've never been to this shop before, it's not your local one that you usually go to every week where you know where the shelves are stacked because you go there all the time. Imagine it's a new town you go to, uh, not new town, but another town, and um, you go to your local Asda or Tesco, wherever you, but you've never been to this one before, so you don't know where exactly everything is. But the milk is in the milk section, the bread is in the bread section. There's no signs. So how long does it take you now? Well, this time it's not going to take you hopefully hours. You'll probably be in there a few minutes, you know, probably 10, 20, 30 minutes, whatever, because you're going to literally go around every aisle until you find all your goods, right? Your fresh produce and your meat and all that stuff. So it's still taking you longer. Now, imagine your third trip, you go to your supermarket, but this time it's on the shelves, as you know, and now it's signposted, there's big arrows on the top and there's signs on the top saying this aisle is where your biscuits are, this aisle is where your pasta is and so on and so on. And also you've got your helpful Tesco people or your other shop saying here to help type things. So you can ask them as well. Now, how long does it take you now? Well, obviously you could be in and out of that shop within minutes, okay? So 
you can whiz in, whiz out, that's how I like to do it. So get in, get out. What is the purpose of classification? Classification is a man-made system. It's, it, it's to suit us, not the animals. It's to suit us so that when we see something and we don't know what it is, I can pick up a classification book and quickly, or within seconds or minutes or so, work out what that thing is. Now, obviously, this is before the day of Google and Internet and apps and App Store, where you can literally take a picture of something and it searches it for you. But 1.8 million things, if I was trying to find a needle in a haystack, it would take me forever. The purpose of classification is to really speed up the process of our identifying organisms and to categorize them in a certain category into a box. And it's in a hierarchical system, which is like you've got the top of the league and the bottom of the league. So as the league stands at the moment, Liverpool are at the top with 25 points clear. You know, they've been waiting 30 odd years to have won this league. And then you've got towards the bottom, Aston Villa, you know, rubbish teams like that, who can't string a few wins together. You know, a waste of space and time. Anyway, um, so you've got a, a league table of hierarchy and classification is like that. It's a hierarchical system. It goes from top to bottom. And the only good thing that might come out of this stupid coronavirus is they might suspend the league and cancel it altogether and Villa may not get relegated, even though they're rubbish and deserve to. Anyhow, so classification. What do I call those hierarchical groups, those, the list of names? We call it, this system, we call it taxonomy. And each, each of those groups are called taxa. So we call all the groups taxa. So one of them is called a taxon. Taxon. Taxon is just one group. So this taxonomy is the study of these groups, this grouping system. So these groups, then this list of these branches are called taxa. Now, there's two types of classification, though. You can have something called artificial classification, where you classify organisms and you categorize them, you put them into groups based on their features. So that's like me saying, okay, I'm going to get, um, here you go. What about based on the features? So wings, let's say. Bat. Stay away from bats. Don't play with them. Don't eat them. Don't lick them. And so on and so on, because bats are bad. Unless you're Batman. But um, bats have wings to fly. Birds have wings to fly. Ladybirds have wings to fly. Flies have wings to fly. Because they fly, that's what they call flies. But they've all got wings. Are they the same type of organism? Are they the same type of species? Obviously not. You don't see a bat and a bird trying to be romantic. Okay? You don't see a ladybird and a fly. They're not the same species. They're different organisms. But we can put them into a category, into a box, like sort them out. Right? Let's put all the wings over there, put all the ones with two legs over there, ones with six legs over there, and so on and so on. Okay? And say, right, okay, they, they all those ones must be the same organism. That's artificial classification. We don't use that one. Although it's got its benefits, like, oh, these are flying organisms. The per problem with that is that they're not very closely related. Therefore, we use a phylogenetic way of classifying. And this is based on the evolutionary relationship and their ancestry. So for instance, bone structure. So if you've got bone structure, um, so if you imagine your hand, so you've got bones in there, obviously in your thumbs and your fingers, these little bones are called phalanges, okay, and you've got your tarsal, uh, carpals, metacarpals. Um, now, yours are very, very dexterous, okay? You can move your fingers about. Now, if you imagine your bone structure is the same as a similar bone structure to a whale's flippers. So a whale's flippers haven't got gaps between them. It's all fused together in one bit. But the bones are there, but they've got skin or tissue between them, with the whole skin's covering it. But the bone structure, if you, if you did an x-ray scan of a whale's flippers, it would be very similar to the number of bones, or be exactly the same to the number of bones that are in your hands. It's just obviously each of those bones will be a lot, lot larger and longer, okay? Because whales will have much larger flippers, not little tiny ones, because if you saw a whale this size, it would be flipping, it would be, not flipping, you know what I mean, like swimming, it would look really weird, like me being, trying to swim there. So, whale flippers, human hand, horse's foot, 
So horses, this evolution, this is back from the GCSE stuff, horses back in thousands of years ago, we've got the, um, the sort of evolutionary, uh, the, the link, the fossil record of the bones over tens of thousands of years of horses. And what we found is the horses used to have bones, well the bones are exactly the same as the human hand, they were obviously larger, but they were spread out. And what we believe is that the land used to be a lot softer, the grass was like marshy and boggy and soft. And if your feet are small, you'll, you'll just sink into the, uh, the mud and you're not going to run very fast. And if some um, animal is uh, hunting you, a predator is trying to get you, you're going to find it difficult to run away and get eaten by the carnivore. Okay, because horses are herbivores. So over time, over thousands of years of evolution, like if you're not sure how evolution works, watch the videos from the previous uh, lessons. Um, over time, those bones started to fuse together so the feet are like one big massive toe and therefore if they're pointed the ground got harder it wasn't so soft anymore now if you're on what if you've got flat big fat feet you're not going to be able to run fast on the ground on the hardened ground but if you've got pointed toes you can generate more momentum and, and, and get faster because of your pointed toes so the horse feet the whale slippers and the human hand have an evolutionary relationship they're more closely related, even though lives in the sea, lives on land, or horses live on land. They're more closely related than those guys over there, even though they've got wings to fly. Because a human hand is to do magic tricks, but also to write and make tools and what have you. Whales flippers to swim, horses feet to run. So different function, like artificial classification wise, different function completely. But they've got evolutionary ancestry that's the same because they're all mammals. Okay, so phylogenetic classification is all to do with ancestry and it's based on a hierarchical system. That's what we mean by hierarchy. And, but the hierarchy, there are no overlaps. Now, how does it look like? What is a phylogenetic tree? This is called phylogeny or a phylogenetic tree. What do they look like? So imagine this has been chopped off my screen. It looks fine on my screen on my laptop. But if you imagine the, that's not an amols, by the way, that's a camels, as in camels. Imagine all evolution starts from a common answer. You know, you were all started from one thing event initially, right from day one. Now, it's like the fountain of life sort of thing. So if you imagine everything came from a common ancestor, but then eventually branched off and branched off and branched off and branched off. How phylogeny works is this. You have a common ancestor, and then the branches eventually break away and then they become different species and so on. And if they're attached to one particular branch, they are more closely related. And the closer they are, the more closely related they are. So, for instance, whales and hippos are the most closely related here. But you would probably think that um, what's more closely related, a pig or a hippo? If you look at a pig and a hippo, they don't look similar but you can probably see something about them that's the same they're both fat i suppose but what the, these are all mammals here on, on this one so pigs ruminants whales hippos camels they're all mammals ruminants are animals that eat grass and things like that and digest stuff like that so like sheep and cows and things like that so um which is more closely related you would think if i said to you is pigs and hippos more closely related or whales and hippos if I said to you, if I asked you that question before I showed you this, you'd probably say, obviously, the pigs and the hippos. But based on the phylogenetic tree, looking at the DNA and the evolutionary ancestry, again, if we did a, a genetic sequence of them, whales and hippos are more closely related than hippos and pigs. And camels are further away from hippos than uh, pigs. Okay? So, or, or whales even, because that's off a separate branch that way. So these guys are more closely related, but the closer you are together, the more closely related you are. So this is known as a phylogenetic tree. So you have a common ancestor and everything comes off those branches. Now, here's a particular uh, type of question you can in the exam. The one thing missing from this one is this little timeline here. So you can see, towards the bottom is the past and right to the top is the present. So you can see there's like little branches here, A, B, C, D, E, where it branches off. 
Now, my question to you is this. If you look at turtles, lizards, snakes, birds, dinosaurs, crocodiles, why is it that turtles, lizards, snakes, birds, crocodiles are this line here, but dinosaurs are slightly lower down from the other words? What, why, what would the possible reason for that be? If you're bearing in mind looking at this line here. So have a think. So is it because they are bullying the dinosaur and he doesn't want to be their friend, so they're sort of beneath them. No, good, I'm glad you didn't think that. What it is, obviously, I think you've all got it, dinosaurs are obviously extinct, possibly been extinct 65 million years ago. They are, uh, a meteor may have smashed into the earth or an asteroid and took them all out. Um, so therefore, that's why it's not in the present line, it's in the past. So you could have other organisms that have become extinct and you are more closely related to than um, uh, to the other organisms. Now, here's my question to you, the next one. Are crocodiles more closely related, not crocodiles, sorry, are dinosaurs, are dinosaurs, if, a quick um, knowledge question for you, or sort of a pop quiz thing, dinosaur, what does it mean? What does the word dinosaur mean? comes from Latin, I think, is either Latin or Greek. Latin, I think. Dinosaur comes from the word, yeah, if you break it down, means scary lizard. That's what dinosaur means, scary lizard. So my question is, are dinosaurs more closely related to lizards or birds to your, you know, as I say, to your chickens? Is a dinosaur more closely related to a lizard like a Komodo dragon, let's say, or your Nando's, as in a chicken? Well, the answer is a chicken. So chickens and birds are more closely related to dinosaurs because, as you can see, they are off the same branch here, like D here. So dinosaurs and birds come off the same branch and they come off this branch here, which also crocodiles come off there. So that's how we use a phylogenetic tree. Now, classification then. So that's what we mean by ancestry. Ancestry means that they all have a common ancestor. It's hierarchical and there are no overlaps. So none of these branches overlap. They are separate entities. Right, so how does the, this is the last thing we're looking at. How does the taxonomy work? It is in your GCSE work as well. So people that did GCSE biology or even science, GCSE, 9 to 1 science, you did have to know this classification, so it's a review of that. Uh, so people that are interested in doing A-level biology need to know this, but also um, GCSE students need to also know this as well. So the taxa then, the first taxa right at the top of the tree of this hierarchy is known as the domain. So the red one there, the domain. Now in the domain, there are three categories, the three taxa, okay, or, or three, not three taxa, the taxa, the domain is the taxa. There are three things in this taxa. There are prokaryotes, and in the prokaryotes we've got bacteria and archaea. So we've got bacteria and archaea, and we've also got what we call eukarya, or eukaryotes. Now, if you remember from your GCSE, prokaryotes have no distinct nucleus. Okay, so that's the main thing. And eukarya, eukaryotes, have a distinct nucleus. They're much larger cells. So eukaryotes are the most obvious ones that you know. All animals and plants are eukaryotic, okay? Fungi are eukaryotic. So protista, they're eukaryotic, okay? Like amoeba and things like that. So long, if there's a nucleus in there and there's membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria right, uh, and um, uh, chloroplasts and things like that, they're going to be eukaryotic. However, bacteria are prokaryotes and archa archaea or ar archaea, also known as archaea bacteria or archaebacteria, they're prokaryotic. Now there is a very small difference between bacteria and archaea. Archaea have got some similar features to eukaryotes, okay, where their biochemistry um, to make them are, are, are very similar. So they're, these guys have got smaller ribosomes, eukaryotes have much larger ribosomes, ATS ribosomes, these have got 70S ribosomes. These guys have got different types of cell walls. So in eukarya, the cell walls in plant cells is made from cellulose, 
but in bacteria it's made from murine okay so it's murine and bacteria archaea is different okay so the first uh, if you look in your textbook there is a list of things that makes bacteria archaea and eu uh, eukaryotes different okay but the, the main thing is that it's the, it's the membrane bound organelles between prokaryotes and eukaryotes and then it goes into a little bit more detail about the types of linkages the sylvester linkages in the cell wall and the chemicals that make the cell walls like cellulose and murine and so on and so on and the, the the biochemistry and the protein synthesis in archaea are more similar to eukaryotes compared to uh, bacteria so archaea kind of slightly lap over to there but um, they're not as um, fully like bacteria they've got some similar features to eukarya but they are prokaryotes because they don't have membrane bound organelles right so after taxa it's the kingdom and there are four kingdoms Pro, uh, protista a pro, a protoctista right um, fungi plantae animalia so protista is your amoeba uh, and, and organisms like that uh, protozoa amoeba things like that single celled organisms that move around and you've got your fungi which are your things like your yeast your mushrooms and things like that and athlete's foot plantae are obviously your plants uh, flowering and non-flowering so you can see that they branch off and so on and then you've got animalia which is your animals okay your animal kingdom and then you split that off into vertebrae and invertebrate so once you get into the four kingdoms um, if we focus we're not going to go into the bacteria uh, domain or the archaea domains um, we're going from eukarya so from eukarya splits into four kingdoms the four kingdoms then are these and then your four kingdoms if we go look at your for instance the they've all got these phyla classes order families genus species now how do you remember the order of them so phyla is the plural for phylum classes is the plural for class orders is the plural for order families is the plural for the singular which is family genera is the uh, plural for the singular which is genus and species is one species is plural for that how are you going to remember them in order? Well, if you just get the first letter, you know what mnemonics like uh, Richard of York gave battle in vain, red, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, for the colours of the rainbow. Well, with this slot, you can say delicious king prawn curry or fat, greasy sausages. Okay? Now, you might think you don't like king prawns. That's not the point. I don't like king prawns, even if it's got tea curl over it, okay, and it's been roasted. You know, I'd rather have chicken tikka on the spit. It's not about what the food is, it's the first letter. So D for delicious is domain. K for king is kingdom. P for prawns, that P is for phylum. C for curry is class. Okay. O for order, or, or is order. F is for uh, family, I missed one out. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So that fat there should be family. The G should be genus. And the S is sausages, which is species. So the purpose of those first letters is this mnemonic for you to memorize the order of them. Because in the exam question, you could potentially get a table like this, where you've got gaps in there, or you might have gaps along there. And you have to fill them in for so which ones which. Now, you're not expected to memorize all of these for 1.6 or 1.8 million different species. Okay? It's impossible. But what you do need to be able to do is by sort of working out which, how many of these are there, which one of those, which one is it, and comparing different organisms. So the easiest one to look at is the tiger. We talked about the tiger last time. And we called it Felix tigris remember we said the genus species name felix has a capital f tigris has a little t remember for the lion it was pantera leo for the rat it was ratus ratus for humans it would be homo sapiens okay but remember we call our names back to front so it's like saying uh sing bobby or hussein amen okay or chanda sophie okay 
Uh, if I missed you out from my class, I apologise. I can't go through everybody's names in my lesson. I've worked your names out backwards. I apologise. Um, if you've got a complaint, put it on Show My Homework or on the YouTube channel. So if we look at animals then, so the domain for tiger, the domain would be eukarya. Okay, so eukaryotic. Then the kingdom is animalia, which is animal. Phylum is chordata. Chordata is Latin for cord, having a cord. What cord? Spinal cord. Okay, so you've got your spinal cord. If you've got an animal that don't have a spinal cord, or doesn't have a spinal cord, like an insect, for instance, spider, it's not an insect, that's an arachnid, but if you have an insect like an ant or something, or a ladybird, you call them nor chordata. N-O-R, chordata. If I put the nor in front of it, nor chordata, it means no cord, no spinal cord. Okay, no vertebrae. So chordata just means vertebrae. So you've got uh, chordata, which is vertebrae. Mammalia, which is obviously mammals. So you can see how they split up. And then in the mammals, you, from chordata, you can split. Remember, you've got birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, fish, right? So we're looking at mammalia. Carnivora, guess what that means? Carnivorous, yes, it eats meat. Felidae, what's that? What family is it part of? Felidae, yep, cats. So lions are also Felidae, okay? Um, I don't know, snow leopard is also Felidae, okay? They're all the cat family, so that's what they call Felidae. And then you've got uh, Felix tigris, so that's why they're different species, because that's their uh, genus species name, the binomial system. Sweet pea, that will be also Eukarya. Plantae, what does that mean? Plantae means it's a plant. Angiosperm, okay? So I just remember those angiosperms, Angiosperm ophyta. It just basically means it's a flowering plant. Dicotyledonous. Dicot. It means that the seeds that they make after they've made the flower and they've made the fruit, the fruit will become uh, inside the little pods because uh, it's a sweet pea, it's peas. The pod is the fruit. Pop open, the peas pop out. Now if you look at a pea, you peel the skin off, it's got two parts to it. So any, pea, any seed that can be like makes two halves like that, it just comes apart, they're called dicotyledonous. If it's a pea where it's just one single pea, then it's monocotyledonous. So this one's a dicot, and then as you see, you can work through those. Pin mold is a fungus, and then we go through all of those. Like I said, you don't need to memorize them, but it just shows you an example of that. So that's your lesson on classification. If it's been useful, fantastic, and you've learned something even better. Um, if you've liked the video, please click like. If you can share it, subscribe to it. And also, um, what's the other thing? Subscribe if you haven't done also already. And if you've got any questions, get back to me on my smart learning. Uh, send a message to show my homework. I'll put the PowerPoint on there. But also, you can send me messages through the comment section on the YouTube channel. Take care and see you next time. I forgot to give you a high five if you got the last one right. All five. Excellent. Virtual high five from me.